Hello and welcome back to Funerals in the Rain. If you enjoy these videos, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and comment below. Welcome back to part two of Alien Contacts and Abductions by Jenny Randalls. 1926, a meeting with three wise men. Just imagine the sheer terror that an encounter with strange creatures can bring. Especially in an age when, age when there was nothing to compare it with. This was certainly true for youngster Henry Thomas, who reported to UFO researcher Peter Howe many years later how a childish pr prank in the Roaring Twenties rapidly turned into a nightmare. Thomas was upset at having been put to bed early on a dark November evening. His friends were all outside, roaming the terraced streets of the industrial town of Bolton, Lancashire, which was then gripped by both the oncoming winter and the paralyzing miners' strike, which had nearly brought the country to its knees. Deciding that he would risk retribution from his police officer father, Henry scuttled out of the bedroom and out into the night. His parents were too engrossed in a radio program to be alert to his less-than-stealthy departure. Meeting his friends, the gang set out to play a game of hide-and-seek, which involved Henry searching the soldierly rows of brick-walled backyards with their rickety outside toilets and grimy facades. But instead of finding his mates, Henry found something that was much worse than he had bargained for. One back gate was mysteriously ajar. Wondering if his friends had left it this way in error as they hastened into the yard, Henry dared to peek within. His friends were not there, but the most frightening sight he would ever face in his life was waiting for him. Looking into the back window of the house were three beings. They were of normal adult height, although one was perhaps six feet tall, but he knew right away that there was not, they were not ordinary men because they were dressed in the strangest clothes he had ever witnessed, suits made up of rolls of tubing of rubber which resembled the Michelin tire man advertisements he would later see so often. Their clothing was silver gray and their thick boots were black, yet each had a transparent dome-like helmet from which emerged tubes that connected into a breathing tank fastened, fastened to their backs. Henry Thomas stared in awe. In doing so, he must have somehow attracted the attention of these beings as they swiveled around to confront him. Then he saw their faces, and panic filled his gut. Their heads were pale and shaped like light bulbs, with eyes that were dark and like slits. The faces had no obvious mouth, and a vertical line of the place of a nose took the place of a nose. They reminded him most of an owl, wise and animalistic, yet somehow inducing great fear from one emerged. A strange gurgling, mumbling sound, and suddenly all three turned in his direction and began to move toward him. At once, Henry fled the scene and ran all the way home. Rushing through the door, he blurted out the story right away. He was scolded for his unauthorized expedition, but his parents seemed to know that this was no joke. For the reality of his close encounter was, re was etched upon his blood-drained face. Of course, this was never interpreted as a meeting with aliens, these were the product of only a few penny dreadfuls at the time, and the term UFO was still decades away from being invented. The three wise men was how the family came to refer the, to this early close encounter, but it is remarkably like several similar episodes during the first half of, the, half of this century, in an inexplicable meeting with the unknown. We might speculate if the boy had seen Rat catchers or fumigators and misinterpreted their strange garb for something more mysterious. But the description of those faces and even the Michelin man suits became not uncommon features amid the UFO waves of years to come. Henry was to be joined by thousands of other people who saw beings with heads shaped like light bulbs and powerfully disturbing eyes. Perhaps he was simply one of the first to interpret their puzzling mission. 1947, take your pick. In June 1947, the phrase flying saucer was first invented after sightings of strange lights in the northwestern United States. It took only a few weeks for the arrival of true close encounters 
of the third kind as meetings with alien beings were to be termed. The location of the earliest intriguing one was extremely remote. The Alps north of Venice, Italy on the border was Australia, uh, was Aust with Aust Austria. The victim in this harrowing encounter was an artist, writer, and geologist by the name of Professor Rap Rapuzzi Johannes, who was following his passion for the rocks by trekking up a valley on the sides of the mountains known as Carnico del Col Gentile near the town of Villa Santina. It was a bright, fresh morning around 9 a.m. on August 14, 1947, and Johannes was alone several thousand feet up the hillside, edging his way upward through layers of gypsum beside the dry river bed. Suddenly, he observed a red object on the ground and, donning his spectacles, realized that it was a lens-shaped object some 30 feet wide and made, up, made of polished metal. It seemed to be a par partially embedded in the rock of the hill slope. The UFO stories had not reached Italy from the United States, and so he looked at this in great puzzlement. Was it a great Russian plane, he asked himself, glancing around in the rather forlorn hope that someone else might be on the mountainside to support his story. He saw two boys at the edge of a wooded area from which he had just emerged, so he shouted at them to come and take a look. Then he began to walk toward them, stopping in horror when he realized that these were not boys at all, but the strange beings only just over three feet tall. As he stared at these creatures, the geologist reported that he felt drained of all energy and a curious lightheadedness or dreamlike quality filled the surroundings. This peculiar aura to close, and to close encounters is now a very well-known feature and is called the Oz Factor. It suggests that witnesses are plunged into an altered state of consciousness at the onset of the experience. The two little men had now moved slowly toward Johannes. They wore close-fitting blue gar garments that seemed translucent. The oddest part of their appearance were their heads, which were larger than the proportions of their bodies should dictate. There were no signs of hair, but they did wear tight-fitting dark skull caps. The mouth was a slit that opened and shut like a fish's gill. Gills, and the nose was long and straight. However, it was the eyes that really stood out. They were huge, round, and plum-colored without any trace of eyebrows or lashes. At closer approach, the scientists could see that the beings had a faint and odd greenish cast of their skins, and this possibly being the origin of the much abused phrase in UFO lore, little green men. Their hands were almost, also more like claws. After staring at one another for some moments, the professor raised his long geologist pick in a gesture intended as a friendly wave, shouting at the same time, Who are you? Perhaps interpreting these movements as a hostile act, one entity rapidly raised a hand from his side to touch a belt that was around his midriff. Flash a puff of light shot from this and hit Johannes Hannes in the arm. The scientist was immediately knocked senseless by this attack and thrown to the ground dazed. At the same time, his long-handed pick was snatched from his hand as if grabbed by a crane and flew through the air on its own to crash to the ground six feet away. Johannes now fell as if he had been struck by an electric charge, could only painfully prop himself on one arm as the beings came over and took up the pick. They were so close he could see their lightly boned chests quivering like a dog when it pants for breath. Then the beings returned to the lens-shaped object and vanished, presumably inside it somehow. Moments later, it shot from the rock, sending a cascade of loose stones down into the river bed. The, sign, the terrified witness lay hopeless, helpless on the ground, afraid that the hovering device might somehow crush him. But after a minute or two, it had inexplicably shrunk in size and silently and imploded or simply disappeared. With this is a tremendous blast of air hit home, rolling him down the slopes and sending him smashing into the riverbed. It was several hours before he had the energy to get up and hobble to the village of Ravio, where he told the innkeeper he had merely fallen off a rock face.
If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below. And stay tuned for part three of Alien Abductions by Jenny Randalls.